Myths of the Realm is the current Alliance raid in Final Fantasy XIV. The final part of the story is coming out soon during 6.5. Since it's been many months since the last part of the story came out, I wanted to create a refresher of events before the story's conclusion, so here is the story so far. Eorzea A land loved by gods and forged by heroes. These words speak of the Twelve, the pillars of Eorzea's faith. These gods and goddesses watch over the land and are represented by one of the six elements. They are... Biergo, the Builder. Ralgar, the Destroyer. Azema, the Warden. Nodthal, the Traitors. Nofika, the Matron. Althic, the Keeper. Halone, the Fury. Menfina, the Lover. Tholiac, the Scholar. Nimia, the Spinner. Limlane, the Navigator. And Ocean, the Wanderer. The students of Baldessian are an organization within Charlian. Their mission is to uncover the mysteries of Hydaelyn and interpret her will. Among the students are your friends and former scions, Kral Baldessian and Graha Tia. In continuing to seek out the unknown and deal with threats, they best carry on the student's mission. After the events of Endwalker, Kral has a task she asks you to help with. The students of Baldessian have received a request for aid from Rambrose of the Sons of St. Koinak. Something has happened in Mordona, and he wishes to entrust matters to the students. This is something beyond the Sons' expertise, uncharted territory. Kral asks you to go to Mordona and conduct a survey, and so you, along with Grahatia, venture out to Revenant's Toll. Upon arriving, Rambrose fills you in on the situation. Recently, an explorer has come to the Sons of St. Koinak claiming to have discovered the Phantom Realm. Legend holds that, across Eorzea, there exists a realm that appears as a mirage. While it has been featured in myths since ancient times, the realm's existence could not be proven. When this explorer presented them evidence of the realm's existence, they couldn't deny their senses. And so he bids you to seek out this explorer and see the Phantom Realm for yourself. You and Graha find the man. His name is Derek, an adventurer exploring the realm. He's currently traveling with a baby Opo Opo, who he had found injured during his journeys. After tending to the creature's wounds, he's been following him ever since. Derek leads the two of you to the navel of the Phantom Realm, the Omphalos, a name that Derek conceived himself. Derek wants to know what this realm is, who created it, and to what end, and why has it revealed itself now? A number of structures are built around the area. You can see the top of the crystal tower in the distance, suggesting that you are directly above Mordona's Silver Tear Lake, though this realm could not be seen from the outside. And in the center stands a stone monument with its base surrounded by the marks of the Twelve. It's unusual that this realm could be located above Silver Tear Lake, as it should not have been able to escape the battle of Silver Tear Skies unscathed. And yet here it is, untouched. This suggests that this realm is displaced from your world, if only slightly. This must have been a place of worship for the Twelve. But by whom? And how were they able to conceal it? Graha wants to return to Charlian to arrange a formal investigation of the Omphalos. But before you can leave, four imposing figures appear before you. You profane this sacred realm with your very presence, they declare, and you must answer for your irreverence. They identify themselves as members of the Twelve, and in Hydaelyn's absence, they declare that they are the star's rightful rulers. Closely have they watched mankind, and they have determined that you, Hydaelyn's champion, pose a threat to their ascension. They would like to weigh your worth, and so they challenge you to a trial. Graha tries to protest, but mortal logic means not to gods. They open their sanctum to you. Come, and prove your worthiness. Beyond each gate lies different domains within the Phantom Realm. Derek has already explored them all. Though he encountered no gods in his forays, he is familiar with these realms and knows his way around. He offers to lead the way, in exchange for your protection. While you answer the god's challenge, Graha leaves to seek further knowledge of the Twelve and apprise Kral of the situation. And so you go, 
you enter their sanctum so that you may stop this new threat from taking over the star and prove yourself in their trial. You venture into Aglaia. One by one you challenge these four gods. You step foot into a domain of lightning. Before a large mechanical spire, you face Birigo, the Builder. As you challenge him, he reshapes the arena around you with his Hammer Divine, a skill befitting the Builder. Upon his defeat, you travel up to the palm of a statue of Ralgar the Destroyer. There, Ralgar awaits you for his contest. He calls down comets from the skies and uses his own fists for destruction. When you best Ralgar, a portal opens before you and a voice beckons you enter. You are summoned into a domain of fire by Azema, the Warden. With her fans, she brings about the light of the sun, and while you face her, she can't hide her enthusiasm. She is enjoying your battle. Azema is defeated and one more challenge awaits. A city is up ahead and the twin gods await you there. Nald, Keeper of the Realm of the Living. Fall, Keeper of the Realm of the Dead. Together, they are Naldthal, the traitors. With the flames of life and death, they are prepared to issue their judgment. They use the scales of judgment to weigh your souls, and they are pleased with the result. Overjoyed with this outcome, they continue to give their all in their trial. They, too, seem to be enjoying this. You have been found worthy. After leaving Aglaia, Graha returns with Kryal. They are relieved to see you victorious, and so too are the gods. They appear before you once again, but in a much different manner than before. As it turns out, this whole quest for domination was a charade. The Twelve have no plans for ascension, and it pained them to speak to their beloved children so unkindly. You have nothing to fear from them. They are not summoned beings. They don't drain the land of Aether, nor do they take men into their thrall. Graha is confused. If this is true, what about the gods who were summoned by Louis Swa during the Calamity? They reveal that was not the Twelve Louis Swa summoned, but a primal born of Eorzea's fervent prayers for salvation. These gods who appear before you now had no hand in that. So what are their true motivations? Why have these gods appeared before you now? Why have they really issued you a trial? Just as men harbor hopes, so too do gods. To realize their aspirations, it is essential that they do battle with you, hence their false claim that they sought world domination. Kral asks the Twelve what these hopes of theirs are, but they will not answer. If you wish to know the truth, you must discover it for yourselves. Press on, and you will understand why they hold their peace. You will learn the truth of their very existence. They bid you go forth and seek further knowledge of the Twelve. When the time is right, you shall meet again. Kral wonders what the true identities of the Twelve are. If they're not primals, then what are they? Kral wishes to investigate the Omphalos, while the rest of you travel around Eorzea to investigate the worship of the gods you encountered. It is believed that the Twelve were already worshipped during the Third Astral Era, when the Alagan Empire flourished. Come the Fifth Astral Era, those whose nations fought in the War of the Magi each took one of the Twelve as a guardian deity. This practice has continued into the present day of Eorzea, with some notable regional differences. The first destination in your investigation is Ralgar's Reach, the holy ground for worshippers of the Destroyer. Graha can't help but be delighted to be here, knowing you spent some time here on your journey. Derek notices that Graha seems to enjoy traveling with company. He finds it interesting, as in his wanderings, he much prefers to travel alone. Derek realizes that when he was investigating the Phantom Realm before, more often than not, sightings occurred in places that have a tradition of Twelve worship. This makes Graha optimistic. Perhaps you're on the right track. You ask around and you find a scripture of the Fist of Ralgar. According to the scripture, some have claimed to have caught sight of Ralgar himself. Their accounts were passed down through the centuries, and worshippers of the Destroyer pieced them together to give shape to the statue overlooking Ralgar's reach. Graha is fascinated by this, for the statue has a passing resemblance to the being you encountered in Aglaia. If Ralgar were a primal, the answer to these similarities would be simple, but he's not. So why are so many accounts so similar? Perhaps there were already agreed upon ideas of his appearance before the Sixth Umbral Calamity. Could it be possible that these divinities existed even before the Third Astral Era? Suddenly, two lights come down from Ralgar's statue. 
and in a flash two small creatures appear before you, a Spriggan and a Hawk. They are Birgo and Ralgar. They tell you that their domains have lain scattered across Eorzea. One of the realms you stepped foot in is even nearby, veiled in illusion. When the Twelve wish to observe the world without, they disguise themselves as these creatures. Being seen in their true form violates their laws of conduct. However, when the ether is unstable, such as during an umbral calamity, gifted mortals may inadvertently see through these magics and catch sight of the realm, as well as the gods themselves. With this information revealed to you, the gods consider this an apology for their deception before. This is all they're at liberty to reveal, and they leave you to your investigation once more. Graha has a theory with this new information. He notices that Ralgar bears many similarities with the Sylph's god, Ramu. Perhaps they were both inspired by the Ralgar of the Phantom Realm. He believes the Twelve gave rise to the prevailing faiths of all of Eorzea, but none of this explains their presence. How and when did beings of such power come into existence? Kral reaches out to you at this time. She has recruited an acquaintance to aid you in your investigation, an authority on mythology. Graha goes to meet this acquaintance at the Sunken Temple of Karn, while you and Derek travel to Uldah to make inquiries about Nodthal. Derek seems slightly uncomfortable with this situation. He's not given to working one-on-one -on -one with another. Nodthal is an unusual divinity. They weigh the worth of men's souls and oversee their financial fortunes. It's only natural that a hub of commerce such as Uldah would come to worship them. What was originally held to be one god came to be worshipped as twins. Rather than two distinct entities, however, what you encountered in the Phantom Realm was a single being possessed of two personalities. While his appearance differs somewhat to the divinities worshipped, it cannot be denied that there are striking similarities in their nature. With your work here done, you seek out Graha at the Sunken Temple of Karn. It is there you encounter Kral's acquaintance, a scholar from Charlian. She identifies herself as Snogium, a collaborator of the students and the expert of mythology Kral was talking about. She is very passionate about her work, and she came here to the Temple of Karn to research the Baladians and their worship of Azema. She is amazed by your tales of the Phantom Realm. The domains you describe to her sound precisely like the heavens of lightning and fire as depicted in legend. In the heaven of lightning, one will find a towering clockwork spire built by Birago, with metal forged from a comet and powered by Ralgar's lightning bolts. In the heaven of fire, sprawls an endless city built by Nodthal from golden bricks fired in the heat of Azema's sun. In ancient times, worshippers of the Twelve believed that there existed seven heavens and seven hells. Six astrally aligned heavens aspected to each of the six elements, and a final seventh heaven to rule them all. Since then, Etherology has established that departed souls return to the Ethereal Sea. But with this new information, it seems those afterlife domains were more than just inventions of mortal imagination. Snogium is very eager to join you on your investigation. She must learn more. The four of you reunite with Kral in the Omphalos. Snogium is quick to observe that this place appears to be the highest heaven of legend, the seventh heaven. Those gateways must lead to the other heavens. While exploring the Omphalos, two things caught Kral's attention. The first is that the gate which lies in the innermost area. If each of the other six gates leads to an elementally aspected heaven, then what lies beyond the last gate? The second is the monument at the center of the Omphalos. It harbors some manner of magic, unlike anything Kral has seen before. She wants to decipher it, but it will take some time. You return to Revenant's Toll for a moment of rest before you resume your investigation. You and the others enjoy a nice meal together in the Seventh Heaven Tavern in Mordona, a fitting location given your circumstances. You have enthusiastic and pleasant conversations with your companions, everyone enjoying each other's company. Having always traveled alone, Derek isn't familiar with this lively atmosphere. However, he's coming to like it. For the next part of your investigation, Graha returns from Charlian with a device called an Etheric Analyzer. It allows the user to take a measure of the ambient ether, recording its waveform to the Ethero transcriber in the back. This will provide you with detailed data of the environment for you to study. With this, you may be able to ascertain the nature of the Phantom Realms. You return to the Omphalos, where Snogium is waiting. 
She has discovered that the magic held within the monument is some form of epigraph. It is incomplete, so you can't read it. You need to fill in the missing information. Where would you find this information, though? Snogium enthusiastically suggests simply asking the gods themselves, and she gathers you all to call out to Nafika, the matron. Nafika answers your call with delight. She, too, wants to speak with you. She sees that you want to decipher the monument and offers you a deal. If you face more of the Twelve in battle, she will grant you the key to that mystery. The gods have been watching you closely as you pursued the truth, and they've come to a conclusion. Even should you uncover the monument's purpose, you would still be willing to lend them your aid. Help them fulfill their heart's desire, and they too shall grant you yours. You take Nafika up on her offer. Originally, the plan was for you and Graha to use the etheric analyzer to revisit the heavens of lightning and fire. But with this new invitation, you switch your priority to the heavens of earth and ice. In the heaven of earth, Nafika planted a single sapling, which Althic coaxed to maturity, bending time itself. In the heaven of ice, rises a lofty palace of ice, made of frozen moonbeams and carved by the Fury's own spear. Kral asks Derek if he will guide your way through the realms once more. He turns down this request, feeling his presence isn't necessary. He would only be a burden. Instead, Graha will join you this time. He will need to manage the Etheric Analyzer, so he won't be able to aid you in combat. With all this settled, you venture forth into the next domain. You venture into Euphrosyne. Nafika greets you upon your arrival. With her breath of the earth, she brings life to the arena around you, as you face off in her challenge. She is satisfied with your performance, and you move on to the next god. The land is remade around you, and you journey upwards where Althic the Keeper awaits. However, he is not alone. Nimia, the spinner, is quick to join him. Though she is a goddess of water, she couldn't resist joining her brother to face you in the heaven of earth. And so, the two gods face you together, combining Althic's power of the sands of time with Nimia's control over the wheel of fate. The sibling gods are a force to be reckoned with, but you are able to pass their trial. A portal opens for you, leading you towards the heaven of ice. A voice calls out, Come, face the next god in the exalted battlefield of ice. Holone the Fury awaits you there, ready to test your strength of spirit. Being the goddess of war, she is a formidable foe. She is pleased with your battle, and you move on to face one more god in a palace of ice. It is there that you encounter Menfina, the lover. She is the goddess of the moon, and she doesn't hold back in her challenge. The phases of the moon are hers to command, and she calls upon her loyal hound Dalamud to join in on the fray. You pass her trial, and she's relieved. Our dreams may yet become reality, she says, as she thanks you and fades away. Your ventures into the heavens of earth and ice were a success, and you return to the Omphalos with the data you acquired. Menfina is curious about what you're doing, and she suddenly reappears. She is not alone. The gods you faced in Euphrosyne have joined her. Nafika had promised you the key to deciphering the monument, and now that you have passed their trial, these gods have come to aid you. They will create the keys you need. You just need to bring to your mind's eye that which harbors information, and the gods will give them form. Across Eorzea lie eternal stones that hold the information required to complete the monument. By holding one of your instruments out to a stone, it will take the information unto itself. The Twelve had scattered these stones across the realm so that mortals would not uncover their secrets. They have since become objects of worship, the marks of the Twelve. Your next step has been decided. You all decide to split up and investigate these stones. To your surprise, Menfina wishes to join you. The Twelve finally have a chance to speak to mortals, to learn about them up close, and they're not like to have another. So you agree to travel together, but not before you hear another voice calling out to you. Four creatures have appeared. They are the four gods you had faced in Aglaia, and they too would join you. The other gods assume their disguises, and each choose one of you to accompany. You and Derek are tasked with investigating the stones within Mordona and Curthus. You are joined by Helone and Menfina. Derek wonders why the two of you have been paired together. Menfina tells you that you make the most intriguing pair, the god's felling hero and the world-faring explorer. 
Before you set out, you are joined by one more. It's the baby Opo Opo, Derek's traveling companion. Delighted to meet you, little one, Minfina says. And so, your investigation begins. The first mark you seek out is Tholiax, just outside in Mordona. You hold out your instrument to the stone, and it records the information stored within. Minfina tells you that these stones are eternal. No matter their shape or location, their nature is unchanging. Together with the monument in the Omphalos, they have remained the same since time immemorial. It was the love that man bare for the Twelve, and Twelve's love of the star, that compelled the gods to create the monument and the stones. You move on to Curthus to your next destination, the Mark of Halone. Derek extracts the information this time. Menfina starts reminiscing that Halone has grown more imposing in the past millennium. It troubled Halone to see her children at war with the dragons, but she says it isn't their place to judge the faith of mortals. Even when they lend them their aid, they must refrain from intervening in their affairs. Mankind's faith in the Twelve is mankind's alone. By your prayers, their forms have become that which they need to be. You proceed to Minfina's mark next. When you arrive, you encounter someone praying at her stone. It's one of the Lambs of Dalamud, and he is shocked to see you. You have hunted down the Lambs of Dalamud before, and this man is scared that you're here to finish him off. The Lambs of Dalamud are a cult that formed near the end of the Sixth Astral Era. They worshipped the Lesser Moon and sacrificed innocent souls in its name. In his struggle for survival, this man had come to worship Minfina, to bask in her gentle acceptance and gain courage from her strong and faithful hound. But this was taken from him by his fellow cult members, who committed horrible deeds. He begs you, grant him deliverance, judge him and show him the way. What good is a god he can't see, who won't grant him a thimble of succor no matter how much he prays? But Derek will not have it. He tells this man that he must not seek in men what he seeks in gods. This man should not be looking towards you for deliverance. Strong as you are, you are but a mortal. Derek advises him to find his own path to walk. All will be well. Keep your faith in Minfina. Believe in her love and grace and you will surely learn to love others as well as yourself. Derek's words touch the man, and he takes them to heart. Derek advises him, should he feel lost again, take to the road. Learn how others live and think, and he is bound to find his way. Despite his preference for solitude, Derek seems concerned for the welfare of others, and with this, the man departs, sent off by Minfina's blessing. Now that that's done, it's your turn to extract information from the stone. Minfina apologizes for the trouble she has caused. She asks you not to hold this against that man. The Twelve do not wish for their existence to bring grief to their children. No matter which faith, they are who they are because of those who believe in them. Minfina's hound is no exception. He was born when men came to worship the object that the elegant empire had cast into the heavens. The Twelve are not all-powerful. They can't grant all of mankind's wishes. Nonetheless, they always hear you. No hope is too small. No prayer too faint. Your task is now complete, but Derek is worried about Kral. She was tasked with investigating the stones within the Twelves Wood. Before heading back to the Omphalos, you decide to check up on her. The gods can sense each other when they're nearby, so it should be simple to find them. When you enter Gridania, the gods with you are able to sense Nafika and Birigo, who had accompanied Kral. But something is very strange. The two of them are in different places. Nafika is closer, so you seek her out first. She is alone, claiming to have become separated from the others, but with some prodding, she confesses that she stayed behind because Kral wanted to visit the stones alone. Nafika doesn't believe Kral to be in any danger, but Birigo is a worrier, so he's been following her discreetly. Nafika can sense Birigo in the South Shroud, and so you follow suit. After finding Birigo, you catch up with Kral in front of Althik's stone. Derek asks Kral why she wanted to travel alone and send the gods away. She tells him she simply wanted to seek answers in her own way. Having seen you embark on countless adventures, Kral has developed the desire to see and experience the world for herself. Though there were dangers, she wanted to prove that she could handle them. Derek can see Kral's yearning for exploration and discovery. It reveals to him the love she bears for the star, and it makes him glad. Kral works on getting the information from the stone, and asks you to wait for her in Quarry Mill. There, Derek can't help but sigh. First the man at Menfina's mark and now Kral. 
In the course of traveling with you, he can't help but enroach upon others' lives. Even the baby Opo Opo that follows him around. Nothing binds him to him, and yet he's been following Derek ever since he tended to his wounds. Once Derek has glimpsed someone's heart, he can't avert his gaze. For this, he finds it truly difficult to be amongst people. All of the stones have now been investigated. You return to the Omphalos. By holding your instruments out to the monument, you'll be able to augment the missing information. And with that, the gods depart once more. The monument has been deciphered, and so Kral reads the epigraph. As beings who endure by the will of the star, we are susceptible to the influence of hopes and prayers. Thus do we commit our yokes therein, lest we stray from our purpose. He who is named Birigo shall preside over construction, his duty to fortify the works of men and encourage them to build. He who is named Rogger shall preside over destruction, his duty to galvanize the star's beating heart and facilitate mankind's regeneration. She who is named Azema shall preside over the sun, her duty to nurture its life-giving light and illuminate the truth for all to see. He who is named Nodthal shall preside over the subterrain, his duty to make gleam the riches hidden in the darkest depths and in men themselves. She who is named Nafika shall preside over fertility, her duty to fill the land with life and prepare a path of peace and plenty. He who is named Althik shall preside over space and time, his duty to endow the star with material vigor that mankind's march may never cease. She who is named Halone shall preside over the glaciers, her duty to hold the melting ice at bay and imbue men with constancy and tranquility. She who is named Menfina shall preside over the moon, her duty to perpetuate the turning of night and day and foster love in the hearts of all. He who is named Thaliak shall preside over the rivers, his duty, to quench the thirst of men and water their minds with wisdom. She who is named Nimia shall preside over the stars. Her duty, to preserve the celestial fabric of the seasons and weave the threads of men's lives. She who is named Limlane shall preside over the seas. Her duty, to administer the tides and inspire men to come together as one and seek new horizons. He who is named Ocean shall preside over the mountains. His duty, to sustain the breath of the firmament, and in wandering, share in men's solitude. He who is unnamed shall watch unflinching. His duty, to stand guard over his charge, always and unto the end. And there does the epigraph conclude. But what could this mean? There are thirteen beings listed here. You all ponder this revelation. You talk about how prayers have changed the Twelve into their present forms, such as how it has given Menfina her hound and made Halone more imposing. Graha realizes that this sounds a lot like Dynamis. He believes that in the presence of that energy, hopes and prayers have more tangible results than one might expect. Over thousands of years of worship could have influenced the gods in various ways. They must have created this monument so that they may never lose sight of their duty, no matter how much they may change. Kral notices that the gods wrote they endure by the will of the star. Who that refers to is someone you all know too well. Hydaelyn. By sundering reality, she must have known that she would shake the very foundation of existence. Anticipating the potential chaos, Kral suspects she charged her collaborators with maintaining stability. The allies that sacrificed themselves to help Vina create Hydaelyn. If this is true, then perhaps the thirteenth unnamed being is the Watcher on the Moon. During your journey in Endwalker, you had encountered a being on the Moon simply known as the Watcher. He had been tasked by Hydaelyn to watch over her prisoner, Zodiark, and maintain the devices that hold him fast. During the Ancients' time, he was the chief archivist at Anamnesis Enider, where he had encountered and befriended Vina. He was among her allies who sacrificed themselves to create Hydaelyn, and it was with his memories that the Watcher was created. Could it be that the other members of the Twelve were created in a similar way? Were they too created from the memories of Vina's collaborators? The Watcher has existed on the moon since the day Hydaelyn created it, and it's ever been his duty to keep vigil over Zodiark. But Zodiark is no more. 
His duty is over, and he has remained on the moon to rest, where he has been ever since. As it stands, you've yet to encounter three gods. There's no telling what may happen once you've fought them all. Kral believes you should uncover as much of the truth as you can, to better know how to proceed. Perhaps a visit to the Watcher is in order. Before that, though, Kral and Graha will return to Charlian to compile their findings and look into the data from the Etheric Analyzer. This is a good opportunity to get some rest and gather your strength. You watch Graha and Kral go on their way, and Derek looks on solemnly. It's not long now before you arrive at the truth. Derek confides in you. For the longest time, he's journeyed alone, not involving himself in the affairs of others. But he's enjoyed this time together. You've undertaken this investigation with all earnestness, and it's been a pleasure for him to be a part of it. When he imagines the moment you part ways, he feels sad, and he's surprised that he feels this way. He excuses himself, and heads outside for some fresh air. Snowgium can't help but worry about him. She's worried that one day he will suddenly vanish and never return. She also wonders why Derek came to you all for help. As an explorer, didn't he want to keep the glory of discovery for himself? You follow Derek and check up on him. Looking up at the sky, he tells you that all things must come to an end. When your work is finished, the two of you must go your separate ways. This will sadden Derek, but that sadness is a part of the joy he has derived from your companionship. He will accept it when the time comes, and strive with you to the last. The baby Opo Opo looks up at Derek, seemingly longing to continue the journey with him. Derek shakes his head. He tells the creature that he would rather it lived its own life. But having helped him, he will not send him away against his will. And with that, Derek bids you farewell. Get your rest. He will see you again in due course. And this is where the story ends, for now. What do the Twelve need? What is their dream? Why do they need your help? Why do they seek to fight you? And what of the Watcher on the Moon? What is his involvement in this? What might he know? For the time being, you rest and prepare for your journey into the remaining domains, the heavens of water and wind, Thalea. In the heaven of water exists a river created by a star melted by Nimia, to which Thaliac added the essence of knowledge and poured it forth from his ewer. In the heaven of wind rises a towering mountain range, atop which Ocean looks out upon the endless sea ruled by Limlane. And it is in these domains the last three members of the Twelve will await you. Thaliac, the Scholar, Limlane, the Navigator, and Ocean, the Wanderer.